Assalamu alaikum. Many other Americans have Muslims in their families or have lived in a Muslim majority country. I know because I am one of them. So I have Muslim members of my family. Uh, I have uh, lived in Muslim countries. The largest one? In the largest one, Indonesia. But my father came from a Kenyan family that includes generations of Muslims. As a boy, I spent several years in Indonesia and heard the call of the Azan at the break of dawn. I have known Islam on three continents before coming to the region where it was first revealed. That experience guides my conviction. You're absolutely right that John McCain has not uh, talked about my Muslim faith. Many people in this part of the world talk extensively about the fact that Ob uh, Obama had uh, has uh, uh, Islamic heritage, that uh, some of his relatives in, in Africa are, all, are also practicing Muslims right now. When the President of the United States says, my family is Muslim, what are you supposed to respond to that? It is remarkable to have a president who can say, I've lived in Muslim countries, I have Muslim members of my family. Uh, that's certainly uh, yet another first. Now look at a part of Barack Obama's life that most people probably have never known about. When Obama's stepfather changed jobs and moved the family to another neighborhood in Jakarta, Obama's mother enrolled him in the Bazuki Public School. This was Obama's former classmate. classmates showed me his old desk. Barry sat here, Barry Barack sat there, and then you sat there. The school's makeup reflects the population of Indonesia, more than 90% Muslim. There is a mosque in the school. It overlooks the playground. And every day at noon, the children are called to prayer. The only record of Obama having attended the school is this old register. And look, it lists his name as Barry Satoro. That's the name Obama took from his Indonesian stepfather, Lolo Satoro. That class register says Obama came from Honolulu and lists his date of birth. But look at his nationality. It's listed as Indonesian and his religion as Islam. As some of you know, my perspective has been shaped not only by my values as an American, but by my experiences as a child in Indonesia and visiting my father's family in Kenya. We will convey our deep appreciation for the Islamic faith, which has done so much over the centuries to shape the world. I would like to speak directly to the people and leaders of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Their great and celebrated culture. Over many centuries, your art, your music, literature, and innovation have made the world a better and more beautiful place. We know that you are a great civilization, and your accomplishments have earned the respect of the United States and the world. I also know civilization's debt to Islam. It was Islam at places like Uluzar that carried the light of learning through so many centuries, paving the way for Europe's Renaissance and Enlightenment. It was innovation in Muslim communities that developed the order of algebra, our magnetic compass and tools of navigation, our mastery of pens and printing, our understanding of how disease spreads and how it can be healed. Islamic culture has given us majestic arches and soaring spires, timeless poetry and cherished music, elegant calligraphy, and places of peaceful comp contemplation. They have fought in our wars, they have served in our government, they have stood for civil rights, they have started businesses, they have taught at our universities, they have excelled in our sports arenas, They've won Nobel Prizes, built our tallest building, and lit the Olympic torch. 
And when the first Muslim American was recently elected to Congress, he took the oath to defend our Constitution using the same Holy Quran in ancient times and in our times. Muslim communities have been at the forefront of innovation and education. As the Holy Quran tells us, the Holy Quran teaches that, the Holy Quran tells us, and the Holy Quran also says, Islam is not part of the problem in combating violent extremism. It is an important part of promoting peace. The enduring faith of over a billion people is so much bigger than the narrow hatred of a few. In the United States, rules on charitable giving have made it harder for Muslims to fulfill their religious obligation. That's why I'm committed to working with American Muslims to ensure that they can fulfill zakah. It is important for Western countries to avoid impeding Muslim citizens from practicing religion as they see fit. And I consider it part of my responsibility as President of the United States to fight against negative stereotypes of Islam wherever they appear. We are no longer a Christian nation. We do not consider ourselves a Christian nation. The United States has been enriched by Muslim Americans. Since our founding, American Muslims have enriched the United States. Islam has always been a part of America's story. There is a mosque in every state in our union and over 1,200 mosques within our borders. You know, one of the points I want to make is, is that if you actually took the number of Muslims, Americans, uh, you know, we'd be one of the mo largest Muslim countries in the world. Let there be no doubt, Islam is a part of America. A lot of reporters who cover the White House were not happy to hear that Barack Obama's first television interview as president was granted to Al Arabiya, an Arab network. But the new president, the first president ever to use the word Muslim in an inaugural address, sent a message with the interview. And today that message was heard loud and clear. The choice of his first television interview was deliberate too. Al Arabiya, a moderate Saudi-owned network seen by millions in the Arab world. The president stressed his own Muslim background. I have Muslim members of my family. Uh, I have uh, lived in Muslim countries. The symbolism spoke volumes. Our fourth story in the countdown, President Obama grants his first official White House sit-down interview not to an American network, but to an Arab one, appearing on Al Arabiya television in an effort, obviously, to reach out to Muslims across the world. As you just heard yesterday in a symbolic gesture, President Barack Obama granted his first formal interview since assuming office to Al Arabiya, a Dubai-based Arabic language network. He did bow to the Muslim king, while he did not do it to the British Queen of England. And by bowing, he showed the world that I am subservient. I do owe, uh, bow down to you as a Muslim king, something no other uh, president has done with Saudi Arabia. The Saudi king is his peer. He is not his subordinate in order to bow for him. And this is exactly what Obama did. Usually it is out of respect that someone would nod his head when bowing to royalty and the ladies will give curtsy. But Obama went beyond what is required as a head of state and bowed to the Saudi king, and that's unacceptable. Right, why, it sent the wrong symbol. What, when you say it's saying it sends the wrong signal, what signal do you think it sends? It sent a message that Islam is superior to any other master or king or president in the world. That an American president bound to a Muslim king. It also sent a message that terrorism and jihadism is giving Islam the respect it, it should have on the world stage to the point that it made an American president for the first time in history bow to a Muslim king.
Barack Obama defending his faith in the campaign trail yet again. This from over the weekend in Ohio. The Democrat, for some reason, uh, for some people rather, is having a hard time proving that he's not Muslim since that picture came out of him dressed in traditional Muslim garb. As somebody who has family living overseas, uh, who myself lived overseas for a time, uh, I would be able to um, uh, I, I think the world would see me as a different kind of president, somebody who can see the world through their eyes. Uh, and so, I, I've said this before, if I go to a um, poor country uh, to talk about how the United States and that poor country uh, can cooperate, uh, I do so uh, with the credibility of somebody who has a grandmother who lives in a poor village in Africa. Uh, if I convene a meeting with Muslim leaders around the world, I do so with the credibility of somebody who actually lived in a Muslim country for a number of years. On behalf of the American people, including Muslim communities in all 50 states, I want to extend best wishes to Muslims in America and around the world. Ramadan is the month in which Muslims believe the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. I know this to be a festive time, a time when families gather and meals are shared. But I also know that Ramadan is a time of intense devotion and reflection, a time when Muslims fast during the day and perform tarawih prayers at night reciting and listening to the entire Quran over the course of the month. Today, I want to wish Muslims across America and around the world a blessed month as you welcome the beginning of Ramadan. Thank you. Well, it is my great pleasure to host all of you here uh, at the White House to mark this special occasion, uh, Ramadan Kareem. Uh, I want to uh, say that I'm deeply honored to welcome so many members of the Diplomatic Corps, uh, as well as several members of my administration and distinguished members of Congress, including the first two Muslims to serve in Congress, Keith Ellison and Andre Carson. Where are they? Give them a big round of applause. And most of all, I want to welcome uh, all the uh, American Muslims from many walks of life who are here. This is just one part of our effort to celebrate Ramadan that I welcome each and every one of you to the White House. Uh, tonight's iftar is a ritual that is also being carried out this Ramadan at kitchen tables and mosques in all 50 states. Islam, as we know, is part of America. And like the broader American citizenry, the American Muslim community is one of extraordinary dynamism and diversity, with families that stretch back generations and more recent immigrants, with Muslims of countless races and ethnicities, and with roots in every corner of the world. Indeed, the contribution of Muslims to the United States are too long to catalog because Muslims are so interwoven into the fabric of our communities and our country. American Muslims are successful in business and entertainment, in the arts and athletics, in science and in medicine. Above all, they are successful parents, good neighbors, and active citizens. So on this occasion, we celebrate the holy month of Ramadan, and we also celebrate how much Muslims have enriched America and its culture. I am so pleased that we are joined tonight not only by so many outstanding Muslim Americans and representatives of the diplomatic corps, but people of many faiths, Christians, Jews, and Hindus, along with so many prominent Muslims. So. Tonight, we celebrate a great religion and its commitment to justice and progress. We honor the contributions of America's Muslims and the positive example that so many of them set through their own lives, and we rededicate ourselves to the work of building a better and more hopeful wor world. So thanks to all of you for taking the time to be here this evening. I wish you all a very blessed Ramadan. And with that, uh, I think we can... Uh, 
start a feast. I don't know what's on the menu. Officials at Georgetown University covered a monogram symbolizing the name of Jesus because it was inscribed on the stage where the president spoke Tuesday. The White House asked for all symbols to be covered at the lecture hall. The monogram, IHS, which comes from the Greek for Jesus, was covered with a triangle of black painted plywood. At the Jesuit founded Georgetown University, there are naturally crosses and religious symbols everywhere. But Tuesday, when this stage at Gaston Hall was set for President Barack Obama, the cross and the letters IHS, a symbol for Jesus Christ's name, were covered over, blacked out. This photograph shows how the pediment above the stage normally looks, but this was how it appeared Tuesday. An army officer, a Muslim convert, is the suspect in a shooting spree. The largest U.S. Army base. At least 12 are dead, military and civilians, while more than 30 were wounded. It was 1.30 local time at Fort Hood. An army officer, a Muslim, opened fire with handguns near a facility where soldiers get medical clearance before deployment overseas. On Thursday afternoon, Hassan was at the Soldier Readiness Center where military personnel gathered for medical screening. He was armed with two guns, one of them a semi-automatic, and opened fire, striking down more than 40 victims. Yeah, there, according to a relative of one of the witnesses to the shooting, Major Hassan shouted Allah Akbar, or God is great, before he opened fire on the soldiers. Can you confirm that from other reports? Uh, there, there are uh, first-hand account, uh, accounts here uh, from soldiers that, that, uh, that, that are similar to that. Soldiers who witnessed the massacre reported that Hassan shouted Allah Akbar, Arabic for God is great, right before he began shooting. I was sitting in about the second row back when, uh, when the assailants stood up, uh, screen, uh, screen, uh, yelled Allah Akbar in Arabic and he opened fire. And take a look at this surveillance video aired last night on CNN. A convenience store clerk says that man is Hassan dressed in traditional Muslim attire, calmly picking up breakfast just hours before the shooting. There are also reports that on the morning of those shootings, Major Hassan was handing out copies of the Quran to his neighbors. Early this year, when Nidal Malik Hassan was still assigned to Walter Reed Army Hospital outside Washington, U.S. intelligence officials say he sent an email to a Muslim cleric living in Yemen, Anwar al Awlaki. Officials say over six months, Major Nidal Hassan traded 10 to 20 messages with the controversial cleric, who has ties to al-Qaeda and the 9-11 hijackers. 
In early 2000, two of the 9-11 hijackers turned up at a San Diego mosque where he was then an imam. He left the U.S. in 2002 for Yemen, and since then, in videos and online lectures, he has offered justifications for attacks on the West. He is literally taking al-Qaeda propaganda written by some of al-Qaeda's key leaders and translating it into English and interpreting it for a Western audience. al awlaki's website now calls Hassan a hero, asking how can there be any dispute about the virtue of what he has done. So essentially, Hassan's former uh, religious leader, now in Yemen, is the top al-Qaeda. Kind of guy. Some are still reluctant to characterize Hassan's attack as terrorism. President Obama's remarks following the Fort Hood massacre described the shootings as an act of violence. Terrorism, he did not say. President Obama says people should be patient and not jump to conclusions about what prompted the attack at Fort Hood. In his weekly radio and internet address, he said with the Veterans Day holiday next week, the country should take time to remember exactly who makes up the armed forces. They're Americans of every race, faith, and station. They're Christians and Muslims, Jews and Hindus, and non-believers. We don't know all the answers yet, and I would caution against jumping to conclusions until we have all the facts. While the president mentioned every soldier who died by name, he did not name the fellow soldier who allegedly killed them, Major Nadal Malik Hassan. One point particularly got to me, offended me, where he said, first of all, that the act at Fort Hood was incomprehensible. Then later on, he said it's hard to comprehend. No, it wasn't hard to comprehend, and it's not now. It was the act of an Islamist terrorist who gunned down 55 people, 54 people, uh, because he believed he was doing the will of Allah in accordance with the Quran. Not hard to understand. And the other thing that offended me in all the speeches at Fort Hood today, not one mention of terror, terrorist, terrorism. I didn't expect him to mention Islamist terrorism. That would be too far for Obama. But what does it take? What evidence does it take for our president to admit this was an act of terror? The day of the shooting, the first state meet, he comes out, he steps to the podium. The country is waiting to hear from the commander-in-chief after 13 servicemen and women under his command were gunned down. We get two minutes of shout-outs before he even addresses it. Number two, he talks wait, 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 about what, this what do you act. Mean you get two minutes, two of, minutes shout of shout-outs. Two minutes of shout at the podium to all of his buddies in the front row before he even gets to a statement on the actual uh, shooting. We're told that President Obama will address oh, this, this uh, shooting rampage now. Let's listen live. Please, everybody, have a seat. Uh, let, let me, first of all, just thank Ken uh, and the entire Department of the Interior staff for organizing just an extraordinary conference. Uh, I want to thank my cabinet members and senior admi administration officials who participated today. Uh, I hear that Dr. Joe Medicine Crow was around, and so I want to give a shout out to that Congressional Medal of Honor winner. Good to see you. Uh, my understanding is, is that uh, you had uh, an extremely productive conference. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming and for your efforts. Uh, and I want to give you my solemn guarantee that this is not the end of a process, but a beginning of a process. And that we are going to follow up. We, we are going to follow up. Every single member of my team understands that this is a top priority for us. Uh, I, I want you to know that, as I said this morning, uh, this, this is not something that we just give lip service to. Uh, and we are going to keep on working with you to make sure that uh, the first Americans get uh, the best possible chances in life uh, in a way that's consistent with your extraordinary traditions and culture and values. Now, I have to say, though, that uh, beyond that, uh, I plan to make some broader remarks uh, about the challenges that lay ahead uh, for Native Americans as well as collaboration 
with our administration. Uh, but as some of you might have heard, there has been a tragic shooting at the Fort Hood Army Base in Texas. A photo that caused a near panic in Lower Manhattan a week ago. It's a lovely photo with the Statue of Liberty just below Air Force One there, just as they planned it. Problem was the sight and the sound of a 747 being chased across the sky, doing a low pass over the New York area, flooded 911, sent a lot of people into the streets, where memories of 9-11 are still fresh, of course. Barack Obama is trying to change political fashion. He gave a speech in Iowa City today, and he wasn't wearing an American flag pin. Those pins have become synonymous with politicians since 9-11. Obama says he doesn't like how the pin has come to represent patriotism in America. Uh, I won't wear that uh, pin on my chest. It's a little weird, Alan, that in the middle of the campaign, the guy takes off the American flag <laughs> that most people wear because they're proud of their country. NASA's top man who says President Obama wants the space agency's top priority to be Muslim outreach. NASA Administrator Charles Bolden traveled to the Mideast last month on a mission of outreach to the Muslim world. In an interview with Al Jazeera, he said President Obama asked him to carry out a three-pronged program at NASA. First, excite young people about math and science. Secondly, expand international relationships. And third and perhaps foremost, he wanted me to find a way to reach out to the Muslim world and uh, engage much more with dominantly Muslim nations uh, to help them uh, feel good about uh, their historic contribution to science and engineering. My first question to you is, why are you here in the region? Oh, I appreciate you asking the question. I'm here in the region. Uh, it's sort of the first anniversary of President Barack Obama's uh, visit to Cairo and uh, his speech there when uh, he gave what has now become known as uh, Obama's Cairo Initiative where he announced that he really wanted to, this to be a new beginning of the relationship between uh, the United States and the Muslim world. Uh, when I became the NASA Administrator, or before I became the NASA Administrator, he charged me with three things. One was he wanted me to help re-inspire children to want to get into science and math. He wanted me to expand our international relationships. And third, and perhaps foremost, he wanted me to find a way to reach out to the Muslim world and uh, engage much more with dominantly Muslim nations uh, to help them uh, feel good about uh, their historic contribution to science and engineering. Well, that was NASA Administrator Charles Bolden recounting his mission as spelled out to him by President Obama uh, in an interview with Al Jazeera TV. So, the President wants our space program boss to focus, first and foremost, on making the Muslim world feel good?
Speaking at a White House dinner Friday celebrating Ramadan, the president waded into the already deepening political controversy over whether to build a mosque two blocks from the site of the 9-11 attacks in New York City. Welcome to the White House. Uh, to you, uh, to Muslim Americans across our country, and to more than one billion Muslims around the world, I extend my best wishes on this holy month. Uh, Ra Ramadan Kareem. Recently, attention's been focused on the construction of mosques in certain communities, particularly New York. But let me be clear. As a citizen and as president, I believe that Muslims have the right to practice their religion as everyone else in this country. And that includes, that includes the right to build a place of worship in a community center on private property in lower Manhattan in accordance with local laws and ordinances. So thank you all for being here. I wish you a blessed Ramadan. And with that, let us eat. I want to bring in our chief White House correspondent, Jake Tapper. And Jake, you've learned more about uh, laying Osama bin Laden's body to rest at sea and, and how that was transported, how that uh, was, was uh, fulfilled, and what can you tell us about that? Uh, he was uh, buried at sea according to uh, Muslim tradition. There was a Muslim seaman uh, who was there, uh, and they wrapped him and said the prayers according uh, to what is uh, part of the Islamic tradition. He's already been buried at sea according to Islamic tradition. Uh, by Muslim tradition, you have to bury the body within 24 hours. So The body has already been buried at sea and that the uh, body has been handled in the traditional Islamic tradition. The burial of bin Laden was done in conformance with Islamic precepts and practices. The, deceased, the deceased's body was washed and then placed in a white sheet. A military officer read prepared religious remarks which were translated into Arabic by a native speaker. John, can you tell us about the, the burial at sea? Where did it happen? When did it happen? Uh, the uh, uh, disposal of uh, the burial of uh, bin Laden's remains was done in uh, strict conformance with Islamic precepts and practices. Uh, it was uh, prepared uh, in accordance with the Islamic requirements. Uh, we, uh, early on, uh, made provisions uh, for that type of burial, and we wanted to make sure that it was going to be done, again, in strict conformance. Uh, we thought it was important uh, to think through ahead of time uh, how we would dis dispose of the body if he were killed in the compound. And I think that uh, what we tried to do was consulting with uh, uh, experts in uh, Islamic uh, law and ritual uh, to find something that was appropriate, uh, that was uh, respectful of the body. So let me say this as clearly as I can. The United States is not and will never be at war with Islam. America is not and never will be at war with Islam.
number one, the other building. Yes, you flew right into it. Thank you. And Ed A. Shoma Mubarak.
uh, on the assumption that you're elected president on day one, you'll walk in yeah. and the war will probably still be on. Yeah. And we know your view that it, the war was a mistake. Right. But here it is, you're at the desk. What are you going to do? We will call in, I will call in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, my Secretary of State nominee, uh, my National Security Advisor nominee, and they will have a new mission, which is to end this war. I will give our military a new mission on my first day in office, ending this war. We can safely bring out one to two brigades per month. We can safely redeploy our combat brigades at a pace that would remove them in 16 months. At that pace, we will have our combat troops out in 16 months. The only mission, we will not have permanent bases in Iraq, and we will not have combat operations in Iraq. The only mission that I will allow will be to protect our embassy and our civilian uh, personnel, diplomats, humanitarian workers. The war in Iraq should have never been authorized and should have never been waged. Should have never been fought. The time for waiting in Iraq is over. The days of our open-ended commitment must come to a close. And the need to bring this war to an end is here. That's why today I'm introducing the Iraq War De-Escalation Act of 2007. This plan would not only place a cap on the number of troops in Iraq and stop the escalation, more importantly it would begin a phased redeployment of U.S. forces with the goal of removing all U.S. combat forces from Iraq. So let me say this as plainly as I can. By August 31st, 2010, our combat mission in Iraq will end. I intend to remove all U.S. troops from Iraq by the end of 2011. We have to be clear and unequivocal. We do not torture. This morning I signed three executive orders. First, I can say without exception or equivocation that the United States will not torture. We will close the Guantanamo Bay detention camp. This first executive order that we are signing uh, by the authority vested in me as president, the, uh, president by the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America in order to affect the appropriate disposition of individuals currently detained by the Department of Defense at Guantanamo uh, and promptly to close the detention facility at Guantanamo and we then provide uh, the process whereby Guantanamo will be closed uh, no later than one year from now. Second, I will cut tens of billions of dollars in wasteful spending. I will cut investments in unproven missile defense systems. I will not weaponize space. I will slow our development of future combat systems. Moving the, the ship of state is a slow process. Uh, states are like big tankers. They're not like speedboats. You can't just whip them around and go in a new direction. Instead, you kind of slowly move it, and then eventually you end up in a very different place.